Two questions that I get pretty often. Why should we invest in space settlement when we have so many pressing problems here on Earth? And what do I have to do with it anyways? I, I'm a mechanic, I'm a banker, I'm a teacher. What, what value could I possibly have to contribute to something that is so technologically complex? To answer that second question, let me go back and give you a little bit of background about myself. My entire life has been dedicated to community development. Uh, when I was 10 years old, I was, I was the weird one in my group of friends, as you can tell by this picture right here. Um, while my friends are out playing basketball and video games, I'm begging my mom to take me downtown. I, I lived, uh, my hometown was uh, Fort Wayne, Indiana. And I'm begging her to take me downtown because we were going through this uh, public planning charrette in town to envision what the future of our downtown would look like. And I was totally geeking out about it. I was an urban development nerd right from the start. And I would go to these planning charrettes and I had a pretty alarming conclusion, realization for a 10 year old. As I would go to them, I would realize each and every time I was the youngest person there by an order of 10 to 15 years, um, which was startling because here we were laying out this fantastic vision of what our city and our downtown could look like 20 years from now, but the generation that was going to inherit that plan wasn't involved in the process. And so I started a nonprofit to fill that void. I uh, started a nonprofit that engaged elementary and middle school students in public planning processes. And in subsequent years, I went on to work in community and economic development at the local level, at the regional level. Um, at the national level, I started a nonprofit that was examining network effects of entrepreneurial ecosystems. And through each of these experiences, I began to kind of craft my own definition of what community development was. It differs a little bit from the mainstream or the text, uh, textbook definition of it, but to me, community development is the act of bringing together people who normally wouldn't interact and leveraging their unique skill sets, their unique talents to accomplish something big, something bold, something that would be otherwise impossible for or near impossible for one individual or a small group of people uh, to accomplish on their own. So as time went on, I began to work um, on community development at the global level with the Teal Foundation out here in San Francisco. And they brought me on to manage the growth and development of their global network of young entrepreneurs and scientists and researchers, um, impressive young people. And the entire thing kind of bubbled out of a, uh, an existing program we had called the Teal Fellowship. And the Teal Fellowship granted uh, $100,000 unrestricted grants to 20 really impressive young people under 20 years old each year. And our program director at the time, Danielle Strachman, realized, hey, we're getting so many impressive um, incredible young people from around the world that are emailing us, that are talking to us. Um, it's, it's a missed opportunity to not do something with that, to not connect them. So many of them could really feed off of each other's energy and some incredible things could happen. So we started with a group of about 150 of them and brought them together. We created both physical and virtual spaces for them to connect, for them to collaborate, um, for them to be able to get to know each other and what each other were working on. And by the time I left the foundation earlier this year, we had grown that network to about 3,200 people across 45 to 50 different countries. And it was an incredible experience because throughout all of it, you've got this, this, this kind of absurdity. I mean, you've got people working on neuroscience projects alongside people working on nonprofits, alongside people working on tech startups and additive manufacturing and human rights issues. And they're all coming together, they're connecting, they're uh, doing things together, they're founding companies together, there were investments that were made as a result of this community. But at the end of the day, the most exciting thing about it to me was the fact that all of these people were coming together with differing perspectives, differing skill sets and talents under the one big goal, the one big objective of creating a brighter future for humanity tomorrow. So what does any of this have to do with those two kind of weird questions I threw up there at the beginning? Uh, so today, or as of about seven or eight months ago, um, I'm working on White Paper Labs. Myself and a small group of individuals, along with the support of a venture capital group in Chattanooga, Tennessee, called Lamppost Group, launched a new organization called White Paper with the mission of addressing grand challenges that humanity faces by enabling sustainable lunar settlement in the coming decades. So when we say enable, because we get that question a lot, okay, what, it, what does that mean? 
Um, when we say enable, kind of picture us as the road crew. There's great people across the country and all around the world who are working on making space settlement and space development a realistic possibility. But due to the fact that that's kind of the road less traveled, they're bound to come across potholes in the highway to the moon. They're bound to come across impasses, power lines and trees down. We're the ones that are out there trying to remove those obstacles as swiftly as possible in the interest of accelerating humanity's path to the moon. And to give you a couple ideas of how we do that, we uh, later this year, actually into next year, we'll be launching what we believe is the world's first space settlement accelerator. So looking for companies that kind of hit that intersection of working on products, technology, services that apply to space settlement, lunar settlement, but also have deep application here on Earth. Uh, but another project we're working on that I'm pretty excited about and we're actually launching next week is uh, something that we're creatively calling the Space Census. And through that, it's a simple form on our website. You can actually look at it right now if you go to spacecensus.org. I think it's live. And uh, on that form, we're looking for every maker, every doer, every entrepreneur, every space enthusiast, student, anyone and everyone that's working on some sort of space-related project. And we want to know who they are, where they're located, what they're working on, and what their biggest roadblocks are. And to illustrate why this is important, uh, when we announced our intentions for Wave Paper back about seven or eight months ago, um, and announced what we were up to, we, ha we were inundated with all of these emails, these phone calls, these messages from people saying, hey, this is fantastic. I'm super pumped about what you guys are working on. Um, I'm not an engineer. Maybe I am an engineer, but I'm not from an aerospace background but I've got something that I've been tinkering away on in my basement or in my garage. Can you guys take a look at it? And can you give me some feedback and help me out? And in each of these conversations that we would have, we started to notice a theme. And to give a specific example of that, just a few weeks ago, I was catching up with one of these people over lunch, and uh, he's telling me about this uh, new invention he's been working on that he thinks could really change the game for refueling spacecraft in space. And he's all excited about it. And I said, this is fantastic. Like, I love what you've come up with. What's your next step? Where, where, where are you going to go from here? And he pauses and he says, well, that's why I wanted to talk to you. I, I don't know. I, I think I need to raise money, but I don't know how to raise money. I don't know how to talk to investors. Someone recommended putting together a pitch deck, but I, I don't know what that is. I don't know how to market and communicate my idea to the general public and to people who don't come from an aerospace background. I don't know what my next step is. I, I Googled the word startup, and that was a black hole. And, and I said, don't do that. Um, and that entire conversation reminded me and really embodied one of our core beliefs at White Paper. And it's that a mission as bold as space settlement, or specifically as sustainable lunar settlement, cannot strictly be seen as a technological problem. Don't get me wrong, the technology is important, obviously, and that's ultimately what's going to get us there. But it's also a problem of communications. It's also a problem of marketing, of legal implications, of capital, of finance, of economics. It's a problem that draws on the talents and skills of each and every individual in this room. And that's why one of our, our core philosophies at Wave Paper is taking this kind of non-traditional community development approach to space settlement. Because we believe that when you bring together people who normally wouldn't see themselves as part of the solution to a grand problem like this, and you offer them the opportunity to connect and be part of the solution, some incredible things can occur. You get these, these incredible explosive collision points. But to go back to that first question that I threw up there, if you can't tell, I like to do things backwards. Uh, why should we invest in space settlement when we have so many pressing problems here on Earth? I actually saw a bumper sticker uh, that said this a few weeks ago, and it kind of drove me crazy because I'm thinking, well, you're asking a question and answering it in the same sentence. Um, the easiest way and kind of go-to answer for this is two-way technology transfer. When you're talking about sustainably putting someone in space, so not a camping trip where we're taking everything we need with us and putting it up there and then bringing everything back, but allowing someone to stay in space at least for an extended period of time, hopefully indefinitely, without the need for constant resupply missions from Earth. The types of technologies that you have to develop have deep application back here to Earth. You're talking about advanced energy storage and production. You're talking about air purification, water purification. You're talking about independent food production. 
you're talking about things that hit the nail on the head of issues, big issues and challenges we face here on Earth around climate change, around global poverty, around global starvation and malnutrition. But beyond that, take a look at this picture and just let it soak in. I love looking at images like this uh, from the Hubble and just taking a moment to breathe. Because as you look at it, it gives you both this sense of awe and also this, this sense of your place in the universe. You realize how vast and incredible the universe that we live in really is and how small our, our home really is. And this is just one galaxy of many, many, many galaxies in the place that we call home, and that is our universe. And when you put it in that context and you think through that lens, and then you think about day in and day out how we talk about coming shortages of energy, scarcity of resources, issues that we face around climate change, all of which are, are, are big, big challenges that we're facing in the next 50 years. And if they don't hit in the next 50 years, they'll hit in the next 50 after that. And as you'll hear today, there's fantastic people all around the world who are working on solutions to those problems in the short term. But in the long term, consider the fact that we live on a pebble floating through a universe far of, or full of far more resources than we could ever even begin to wrap our heads around. And we haven't even begun to scratch the surface of that potential. Imagine a future where we are collecting raw solar energy in space and beaming it back down to Earth through microwave technology. Imagine a future where we're able to mine asteroids for rare Earth metals. Imagine a future where each and every one of us has easy, reliable, affordable access to space on a regular basis. And then consider the fact that a lot of these things aren't crazy, they're realistic, they're coming, and many of us in this room will probably live to see them in our lifetime. Space settlement is not about luxury trips into space and the chance to have a condo on the moon. It's about the opportunity to usher in a new era of peace and prosperity for all of humankind. And if that's not a good reason to go, I don't know what is. But to bring it back home, so to speak, I, I personally believe it's inevitable. We've, we've been explorers since day one. It's in our DNA. We're curious seekers. We seek out adventure. We seek out new possibilities. And we're constantly looking inward. We're constantly looking outward. For thousands of years, we've been looking at the stars, pushing the boundaries of what's possible. We have an incredible track record of proving ourselves wrong when we deem something impossible. I have no doubt that in the future, in the near future, we will become a spacefaring species. And Earth will not be the only place that we call home. But if we're ever going to get there, it's going to take each and every one of us to make it happen. Thank you.